Welcome to another Museum FAQ video. I'm Paul Orselli, President and Chief Instigator at POW, Paul Orselli Workshop here on Long Island. And I am delighted to welcome the Natalie attired Jessica Strick all <laughs> the way from the other side of the North American continent on the West Coast in California. Hello, Jessica, how are you? Hello. Um, I'm doing good in the smoke-filled yeah, area. Both, it's, it's not as if it's not as if there aren't uh, enough things to keep track of these days. But now in California, and especially your part of California, when we're recording this, there are wildfires. So I, I yes. hope I hope at least uh, you are safe and sound. So um, if you need, to, <laughs> that's good. I don't want. It, if we need to stop and you need to run off, <laughs> you just leave, don't yeah. worry about it. Uh, but then, based on the way you're sitting uh, calmly there, I don't think that's immediately a concern, thankfully. Yeah. All right, well, I always like to start um, these conversations by asking the guest or the guests to tell us a little bit about their background, just because, especially people attached to the museum world, their backgrounds don't always sort of follow this straight line path necessarily. But uh, in any event, why don't you start us off and tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Uh, so I went to University of Michigan and studied history. Go blue! <laughs> <laughs> and where I actually had my first encounter with a hands-on museum at the wonderful Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum, where I was I was charmed, though I didn't realize that this was going to be the this that it didn't it didn't occur to me then that that was what I wanted to be doing with little, my life's work. Little, little did you realize how momentous that charmed feeling <laughs> <laughs> would carry carry you forward into your career. Anyway, who would have thunk? So yeah, so I graduated with a history degree. I avoided science. I took like the minimal amount of science I could get away with um, and uh, moved to San Francisco, had a bunch of flaky jobs, <laughs> but I, um, I, I started working at the Bay Area Discovery Museum thinking that, okay, I, I like working with kids. I, uh, I, I like being in a place that has sort of an artistic feel. The Area Discovery Museum is an awesome place. I actually don't love working with kids, I discovered, but I did fall in love you, with- You discovered something at the Discovery Museum that you didn't necessarily expect, so. I did, I did indeed. Um, so the, yeah, but I loved the environments and it occurred to me while I was there, I was like, oh, somebody had to make this and somebody had to design this. And it, it honestly, I hadn't put that all together in my head until I was working there and seeing behind the scenes and talking to people who made those things. So after that, I started hearing about the Exploratorium. I had only been to the Exploratorium, I'd been to the Exploratorium twice prior to getting interested in working there. The first time was to see <laughs> a flea circus that was part of a program. And I was like, this sucks, because all the fleas were dead. <laughs> so I was like, what kind of circus uh -oh. is this? So you were not, your first visit, you were not charmed. I was not charmed. I was like, felt like I was scammed. <laughs> and then the second time I went was uh, as a camp counselor with a huge group of kids. And we showed up for an August free day. And I spent the entire time in line for the bathroom. So that was my that was my <laughs> my first experience with Exploratorium. But once I was at Discovery Museum, I um, I was hearing that that was a good place to be, and that they had this amazing workshop. And so I had already had this bug in my head about like I want to work in a workshop. Like this was just something that was I just saw like that's the environment I want to be in. It is in a workshop. So I, um, I started working there as uh, I, my first job was handing out, uh, <laughs> this tell <laughs> says how long ago this was. I, I was handing out audio tours, which were in, on CDs and you'd hang it around your neck 
and you listen to an audio tour for a wonderful show called Turbulent Landscapes. This was like 1996, long, long time ago. Um, so I did that big, job. Big, big Ned Con energy. Oh yeah, big Ned Con energy. Lots, like it was actually a great introduction into what I love about Exploratorium. It was just playful and multi-sensory and just beautiful stuff, like art. So it was, it was really nice. Um, and from there, I became an explainer and learned a whole lot of science. So suddenly the things that I had been avoiding basically my whole life up until then, all that science, I was getting this totally different take on it which opened my eyes up a whole lot and made me really excited to learn about science and to learn about science in this kind of environment. Um, and from there, I was focused on just what I wanted to work in the shop. I wanted to get trained on tools. It was an environment where I could go in, ask for some help. And Tom Tompkins, who is a mentor to many, many people, helped me make my first, uh, like a, a CD book, a CD case, a shelf for CDs. <laughs> CDs were my entry into Exploratorium. I tell you. The audio if, tour to the workshop. If, yeah. if there was ever anybody who was going to be canonized in the museum <laughs> exhibit business, it would be St. Tom Tompkins. I'll tell yeah. you, what, what, a, what a tremendous person and a giving and generous person. Yes, big shout out to Tom Tompkins. He's, he's, he's a wonder. Um, so yeah, and so I, start, I got my skills. I didn't have any shop skills, so I had to learn a whole lot. And I had a lot of good mentors and two, like lots of good support. It was a time when it, the living was pretty easy in, it, in San Francisco. Like, I, I don't know, like this is actually the tragedy is that now, like you can't live off of a minimum wage, off of minimum wages and be in San Francisco. So it was a different time, honestly. And I, it was really lucky and I, it was a privilege, it was good. Um, so anyway, I learned a whole lot at that time. And then or somewhere in there, I was like, I need to go to museum studies school and get more professional. I got a degree in museum studies from JFK. And during that time, I got an awesome internship at the Long Island Children's Museum <laughs> um, under your great mentorship. So that was that was that was a huge thing. And actually, that was the that internship is where I made my first big exhibit. Uh, Not about like gears. I there were a couple other little ones. About gears, ones, about, like gears. One. about gears, yeah. right? about pulleys. So pulley yeah, table, pulley. the pulley table exhibit has now been, it's like now all over the place. So it's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. So that was, yeah, that was a big, big learning experience for me. Um, and since then I've been on the going eight project, which was what had, where I further developed the pulley table exhibit, um, on mind project, you want me to list all the projects or is that getting to like a lot of projects, you, but it was, um, this is, you are the guest. This is a conversation. You talk about whatever you want. I, I'm not going to list them because I'm going to forget them. I've been, oh, but you, know what? you mentioned project eight. So that's a good time in YouTube land for us to say, we will make sure to include links and references down below, including Project 8, Active Prolonged Engagement, which I was an advisor on, coincidentally. Hey, yes. And I think that's an excellent book. Speaking as anybody who's watching this who really wants to, if you want to pick up a book to really think about the process and the sort of messy process and the, how evaluation intersects with that and how you make and remake things, wow, you, you should pick up that book for sure. Yep. It's a, it was a, um, it was a really important time and it's been like a touchstone for us in the museum. And I think it's, it's, a, 
it was an important project and it was also, you know, a different era. We were getting like huge, lots of money from NSF. So there was, I, I feel really lucky to have been on that. That ship has sailed a long time ago as it relates to exhibit projects for the most part. But anyway, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, uh, you, your story, that just that might, we might be able to stop the, the video right now just with the story you told about your background, but I'm not gonna let you off the hook that easy. Although I will say, wow, there's like a great headline there in terms of your connection to uh, the Exploratorium from parentheses dead, flea circus to master <laughs> exhibit developer. <laughs> I mean, come on, and all the twists and turns there and all the projects you've been involved with. Well, that's a great segue, though, to what I would uh, like to talk with you about, because since, well, I don't know what your actual exhibit, what your actual title is. Are you a lead exhibit developer? Are yes, you, I am. I'm, I'm going to call you a, a master exhibit developer. <laughs> that is actually a title that I don't have. Well, so I don't know if you can technically call me that, but I can. you can call me what you want to call me. I can call you whatever I want. This is my <laughs> video. If somebody wants to complain, put it in the YouTube comments. The, yeah. um, along with a like and a subscribe. No. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I'd love to hear you talk, Jessica, uh, because now you've been, uh, we were just talking before we were recording. You've been at the Exploratorium a good long time, over 20 years. And so um, I'd love uh, to get your insight and to share with people who are watching this, maybe some thoughts about what kinds of things have more or less stayed the same about your personal practice and the exhibit development approach at the Exploratorium and what things have definitely changed. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, and you can just, it doesn't have to be in any order because I just threw that sort of messy question right in your lap, but I'd love to, I'd love to get your insight about that. Um, yeah, it's such an, it's, it's a big, yeah, there's been a lot of change. I will say that. Um, I think at its core, at the core, I feel like I, um, I get to make cool stuff. Like I get to come up with ideas and I get to develop them and design them. And maybe sometimes I get to build them that, like it's build, build prototypes. It's changed a bit. It used to be the developer does everything. Um, and uh, there was a lot more free reign, I would say. So I, I, ha I feel like I do have a lot of free reign to explore ideas, but um, it's, it involves more teamwork than it used to, which is good, right? Like teamwork in a lot of ways is really good. There's the roles though are now more divided and delineated. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So it sounds like in terms of the, a lot of the concepts and maybe initial ideas uh, that that you still have a lot of free reign. But it, in terms of, are you talking about implementation, like actually the 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 physical <laughs> the physical construction and the physical? Yeah, let me, actually, let me restate it. Um, you get to edit this. You get to edit this, or is it now? Okay. <laughs> you can edit it. <laughs> That's fine. I, I mean, I think what has changed, uh, okay, I, I would like, I would come up with an outline of a few things. And one big thing that's changed is we don't, we are not at the Palace of Fine Arts anymore. And the Palace of Fine Arts is a funky, messy, leaky, crumbly, rat infested <laughs> place, right? So like, there are, generate like years and years of exhibits that fit that environment that are like pulled together with two by fours and like 
you know, just not beautiful, but like funky and with a lot of personality. I personally, I love that. I think our new space has maintained some of that like big wide open in, you know, pretty industrial. It's not, um, but it's not grimy in the same way. <laughs> so you can't have exhibits that look grimy in that space in the same way. So it's just, we are refining the way we build exhibits. Um, and part of that is we have, you know, we now have 3D designers and we have engineers. I mean, we've always had these people in some form, but it's, it's usually been embodied in an exhibit developer, but now we have these different roles for, for people helping to make our exhibits. So it sounds, Sounds a little bit, sounds a little bit like, and this is just my characterization, uh, sounds a little like um, you at the Palace of Fine Arts, you had this sort of band of pirates. Yeah. Then you, you had to sort of clean them up a little bit for the, for the new house, for the yeah. bigger sort of nicer house. Uh, a little bit, yeah. I would say there's still funkiness and like we no, don't get to, sure. but, at, but, now, <laughs> so we did a whole bunch of exhibit development for the new location. So that was where like all our energy was in the move and getting our stuff over there and making it nice there. But now um, almost, most work right now for the museum is actually not for the museum. We're doing a lot of global collaborations projects. So that is like, Funkiness is uh uh like no funkiness, no two by fours allowed at all. People like we can not, make like people are not paying the big bucks for yeah. for funky greasy two by fours and some pirate to come swinging through on a big rope. That 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 unless yeah. you had a very unusual client, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, so that is that is that's a big change. Like we yeah, so the type. So what I'm doing as an exhibit developer is I'm making working prototypes. So that's, that's something that, you know, working prototypes is what we've always talked about. It's the, it's the Frank Oppenheimer, like just put it out there and then we'll fix it when it's, when we see the need, that's how we make exhibits. And that, that's a model that, you know, I can do, I can, I am capable of building things that are uh, a little janky, but like are functional and maybe don't look <laughs> super slick, but are functional. No, but so then, but then this is interesting, but then you can conceive or you, you're assigned an idea and you can sort of put together this prototype, something to actually test with real visitors on the floor of the Exploratorium before it, before it goes into the transmogrifier and- yeah. Critified. Uh, no. Yeah, exactly. But, but, but so there's like a whole a whole additional phase that is happening, you know, so that we can make these exhibits be solid and slick and like go to Brazil and not have like somebody worrying about the maintenance of it, you know, like well, yeah, I mean, it has to be to, that way. To to and to be fair, especially if you're dealing with projects worldwide, it's one thing if you say, oh, I'm just going to make this exhibit that sits three feet outside the walls of the workshop that I can almost always keep a peripheral eye on. Even if I make it with bailing wire and string, I understand also I'm responsible for making sure that it's safe and operational. I mean, that yeah. doesn't really play. If your exhibit, you're in San Francisco and your exhibit's in Brazil or Timbuktu, uh, so. Yeah, exactly. Unless, right. you, unless you, unless the Exploratorium has this souped up private plane for exhibit developers that I haven't heard about. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's obviously, especially now, like, um, yeah, we got to get things really buttoned down before we, like, we have a bunch of exhibits going to Singapore. Typically those get installed by the people who made the exhibits, but now we have to have it all done on video and like you can't go set that stuff up. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So obviously that's, that's a little bit of a change. And I, I just feel compelled to state for the record that uh, I loved um, certainly 
the, the funky aspect of the Palace of Fine Arts. But I am not one of those people who are like, oh, the good old days. And uh, I mean, I, I also like the, if you want to characterize it this way, the new exploratorium, the current yeah. exploratorium. So, you know, I, I think it's a mistake to, um, you, you can be happy, you know, it's like a, whatever, you know, you, you went to college or high school with someone and maybe you don't see them for 20 years. That doesn't mean you don't think you, you had a wonderful experience with them, but now you're on to something else. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's, uh, that's interesting. So there is a level of um, maybe both construction and construction process and aesthetic sort of um, additional layers or additional gloss added to things. Yeah. Um, what about what you talked about prototyping? Let, let back up a step. What about the actual process, the front end of the process, not so much about the product? How much of that from your perspective, you know, what parts of that have changed or stayed the same or, you know, is it all the same? Um, the, the front end part yeah, of it. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think um, it's, I would say the biggest difference I would say is um, for these projects that are for clients, that is a whole new body of people who are, who we're collaborating with. So that, uh, that's just, you know, like, so we are coming, we're still doing the process of like how we come up with ideas, which, you know, with advisors and research and floor testing and all of that. But we also have this additional group that we're working with who are the clients. So that's, and that's been a little confusing sometimes because part of what we're doing is we're consulting with them and like we're the experts we've been making exhibits for all these years so um but they also have the you know their priorities and and so we have to make sure it all balances out and like we understand each other and that's and that's like client work is like a very different kind of work so that's just for me personally like that's that's a big that's a shift for sure yeah, yeah. But it's also gotten us into really it, totally different areas and it's been really interesting. There's, I mean, there's, there's uh, challenges and there are, are, you know, good things to be gained from it. Sure. Well, like, <laughs> like, I suppose like every part of life, you know, that's, right. that's true. Well, you yeah. know, um, I, I always like to um, give <laughs> I always, instead of, uh, even though we're uh, recording this during pandemic times, I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, peering into the pit of despair. And, uh, you know, we, we talked before we started recording. Obviously, uh, these are, um, at the very least, uncertain times for museums and museum workers all around the world. So that's certainly nothing to be made light of. But I, I'm wondering, um, you know, if we could turn the way back machine way back when to there you are, this uh, University of Michigan history undergrad, uh, little did she realize what an impact not only the museum world would have on you, but the impact you would have on the museum world. And I mean that in a sincere way. Um, <laughs> what what sort of um sort of hopeful notes might you uh throw out there for people either people who are emerging professionals or people who are watching this and they're like man i'd love to uh work at a place like the exploratorium or i would love to uh be part of the exhibit development process at a museum and that what what uh, throw out a couple of hopeful and helpful takeaways for people who might be um, either struggling with their own personal practice now or thinking about oh, what, what happens next or you know, people who might be uh, considering a, a, a new career in exhibit development or a new yeah. career in the museum world. 
Oof. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, what would I say? I, I think. Or, or honestly, Jessica, you know, we yeah. could, this could, this thing, this conversation could veer off in a completely different direction. I don't want to put my thumb on the scale and say, oh, okay, now Jessica, put on your happy face and tell us something that'll make everybody okay. feel good. So I, oh, geez. I see a fire. <laughs> I, oh, no. I, I see a fire. I totally see fire. Like something is out, something is burning out in the city. I don't know what it is. Um, woo. Yeah. Um, I I think what I would say is the thing that is I feel hopeful about is that I think that in the time that I've been an exhibit developer, there is maybe more of a focus on bringing your bringing your whole self to the process and i say that because um like having worked on the edge project and um, which is the exhibit design for girls engagement i feel like that for me was really um affirming like that some of the sensibility that i've had um works for girls <laughs> like that's what do you know i'm a girl you know so i i i think that um I think, and I think about uh, the work that I did also on the self-made project, um, which was uh, last summer's show at Exploratorium, where I think we we really felt the the lack of diversity on that project, like that it was a hindrance and that was really not good. <laughs> like it was, I mean, I think it was a real challenge for us to try to to do this exhibition and it and it just again like confirmed for me like we got to have a more diverse group we need more voices we need we need that perspective because I, I know I think something that I've been able I've been able to do as myself is be that person who shows up at a science museum with no science background and I actually think that perspective has been good like i think i why was i why have i not liked science like why did i not was i not drawn to science so like that perspective is super important to bring to a science museum yeah, not, not everybody who comes to a science museum is a trained scientist or has a background in scientists mm -hmm. science at all so right. absolutely that's an important right. perspective right so i think um yeah, recognizing like the potential, the potential power of of these different perspectives, I think is is where I have the most hope. Um, yeah. Well, that that uh, that sounds like an an awesome and a hopeful place to end this conversation. I think the more, I think. Um, I'm sure it resonates with you. Uh, it, it seems like the the best projects are ones that have the most diverse perspectives and the diverse participants. And there are often robust conversations, but they're robust but respectful conversations that push people to think about things and to make the end product even better. So. I think that's great. I think that's an important um, point to to end on about bringing in multiple perspectives and doing that in a in a meaningful and respectful way. So, well, Jessica, awesome. <laughs> I'm 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 uh, I'm uh, I don't want to be funny and say I, I I hope that fire you just saw out the window is not a problem, but uh, uh, it was great. Great to speak with you. I'll just say again, because you, you mentioned a, a number of projects and um, uh, we will, as again, they say in YouTube land, put, put links and references yeah. below and also um, things about you and your work or things that you might have written or just want to highlight and let people know so they have an additional insight into you and your work as well. Well, um, and also, bonus points for the great outfit <laughs> so <laughs>
<laughs> thanks. Oh, it looks great. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks very much. Best to you and your family. And thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Oh, well, you, you, <laughs> you add, you add to the honorable role of conversance. So, <laughs> okay. Thanks again. All right. Bye, Paul. Thank you.